Welcome to our study of the story. We are beginning chapter 22, The Birth of the King. This is the first chapter in the New Testament. Before we go any further, I'd encourage you to pause the video and read through pages 309 to 311. Our first question, how does John describe the relationship between the creator and the created? On page 309, the first page of the pair of the chapter, we see Jesus being described as the true light, the creator. It says he was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own and his own did not receive him. Ever since the fall into sin, the rebellion of Adam and Eve, by nature, mankind is rebellious and separated from God. When Jesus Christ came into this world, his own creation did not recognize him as God. This is, illustrates that separation between God, the creator, and his creation because of sin. Uh, what relationship is restored through trusting in Jesus? On the bottom of page 309, it points out, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Uh, the reference to becoming children of God, not just physical children as part of the creation, but that relationship of a father and his children. That relationship which was broken in the very beginning with mankind's rebellion and restored through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what the whole Bible is about, the story of God restoring this relationship that he created mankind to have with him from the very beginning. And this relationship is restored through faith in Jesus Christ. On the top of page 310, it references the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now the basic message of the law that was given through Moses, illustrated, clearly proclaimed with the Ten Commandments, is summarized as Jesus and in the Old Testament prophets summarizes it, is to be holy, to be like God, to be what God created Adam to be in the first place, Adam and Eve to be created in the image of God, that is to be holy and perfect. And to fall short of that glory, anything less than that glory, is imperfection and is separated from God, deserves to be condemned. The law shows us our sin. It shows us our imperfection. Um, that's why every time we study or read the Ten Commandments or think about God's law, we feel uneasy and guilty. Even though we as Christians know we are forgiven, Still, it is that, that sting, that hurt of knowing that we have fallen short of God's glory. Grace and truth given through Jesus. Grace, a gift. What is it that we do not deserve? God's love, God's mercy, restoration into that relationship with our creator. Grace, that gift comes through Jesus Christ and through the truth of who he is and what he has done. The truth that he is true God and true man. The truth that he willingly gave his life for the sins of the world. Offered that perfect life as a sacrifice. The truth that through trusting in him, we are credited, judged, holy and perfect as he is. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is and what he has done. Is the grace and truth that we've just been talking about, the grace and truth of Jesus found in the Old Testament? The answer is simply yes. The whole Old Testament proclaims the promise that the Messiah would come, that grace and truth can only come through that coming Messiah. It was found right there in the garden when God spoke to the serpent and proclaimed, promised that the seed of the woman would come and crush the serpent's head found in all the other Old Testament promises of the Messiah because it is on that grace and truth that all Old Testament believers placed their faith. Even though they did not know specifically who Jesus was, they knew that the Messiah would come. 
and that's in who that's who they trusted. Likewise, is the law of Moses found in the New Testament? Yes, very much so. Jesus taught the law very well, specifically in the Sermon on the Mount, as he pointed out that the law, people should take the law more seriously than even the Pharisees were teaching it. Now, the law of God is found throughout the New Testament, not only helping to reveal our sins, showing us a need for the grace and truth of the Savior, Jesus Christ, but also then in the forgiveness of God, being the guide that shows us how we can thank God. Uh, we love because he first loved us. How do we know how to love others and how to love the Lord? It is the law that guides us. But now back to our text on page 310, we read that when the angel came to visit Mary and tell her that she would be the mother of the Savior, he says, greetings, you who are highly favored. And then in his message, he says, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. Uh, many people misunderstand this highly favored. It's not that Mary is any co-redeemer or anybody through whom we are to pray to God through Jesus Christ, because of Jesus Christ, we have access directly to our Heavenly Father as Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer, our Father. But Mary truly is highly favored. Out of all the women in the world that have ever been born or ever will be born, she is the one who God chose to be the mother of our Savior. Again, Mary would be the first person to tell you, I don't deserve to be worshipped. I'm just a sinful human being who needs a Savior like everyone else. But she is the one God chose to be the mother of our Savior. And that truly is a great blessing from our Lord. Of what does the virgin conception and the birth of Jesus tell us about the man Jesus? Well, as I've mentioned many times in various classes and sermons, uh, the early Christian church thought it very important to clearly identify that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Uh, that brings out the simple truth that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, that he is true God. He is not an offspring of a sinful human man. He is not the offspring born in the image of Adam. He is born without sin. He's conceived by the Holy Spirit, but nonetheless also true God, or true man, pardon me, because he was born of the Virgin Mary, conceived in the womb, grew, came to full term in the womb of Mary, was born a child, breathing with flesh and blood. Again, the virgin conception and the birth of Jesus remind us of exactly who Jesus is, true God and true man. What does Mary's song, the Magnificat, teach us about a relationship with God? It's a beautiful song, beautiful words of praise. Mary begins it off, begins by saying, my soul glorifies the Lord. That's where we get the name, the Magnificat. That's the Latin, the first word in the Latin, it magnifies, namely her soul. Uh, notice again, to this speaking to the idea that Mary somehow is a co-redeemer, uh, she says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He, it is God who saves alone. But now to the question specifically about what does it teach us about a relationship with God? There's a couple of key phrases in there. It's on page 311. His mercy extends to those who fear him. Again, so many people nowadays don't like to speak about the fear of God or don't want to think about an angry or a judgmental God. Uh, that's not exactly what's being spoken of here. Fear of the Lord is to recognize that he is in charge. Now that does bring in an element of if I cross him, if I do contrary to what he commands, I should be afraid of his punishment because he is more powerful. He is right and I am wrong. But the wonderful thing is it says his mercy extends to those who fear him. Uh, again, Everybody who knows me personally knows I always like to go to the two men that went to the temple to pray. The tax collector came in, Lord, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. He knew that he deserved God's punishment. He admitted his sin. 
God was merciful to him. Jesus said, that's the one who went home justified. The two thieves on the cross. The one who said, we deserve to be here. But Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That is who the Lord is merciful to. Those who willingly, humbly admit their sin and trust in the Lord. That, that same thought is expressed in another line where she sings, he has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. There is no better way. There is really the only way to approach the living God, who is our creator, savior, and king, is to approach him in humility, because he is God, and we are not. He is creator, and we are the creation. He is the savior, and we are the saved. He is the king, and we are the people of his kingdom. It is proper to approach him in humility. The wonderful thing is, as we approach him in humility, he does not push us down, but rather lifts us up. And finally, what does Mary say that the Lord has remembered? Again, Mary is part of that community during that transition time. Old Testament believers stepping in and living into the New Testament times. She references that with the fulfillment of this promise for her to give birth to a Savior, she is rejoicing in the fact that the Lord is remembering his promises. And again, as we see that phrase used throughout the Old Testament, it's not like God says, oh yeah, that's right, I forgot, I promised that. No, the phrase remembering his promises is a way that it's expressed that now it's time to fulfill that promise. And she rejoices, he has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary refers to all the promises of the coming Savior, all the promises of God's mercy through that coming Messiah that's found in the Old Testament. Not only the seed of the woman that will crush the serpent's head, but the promise she references given to Abram of how through his offspring, through his seed, all nations would be blessed. At this point, I encourage you to pause the video and take a few moments and read through chap or chapter 22, pages 311 to 313. Start the video after you've completed reading those pages. We have to start off with just a, a little bit of a correction. Again, the italicized print behind the regular face print are the uh, abridged notes of the editors. Uh, there they speak about Jesus or about Mary and Joseph only being engaged. Um, that's technically not correct. In some ways it is and it isn't. Uh, we need to remember the Jewish ceremony of a wedding it was not something like what we're, many of us are used to, where you walk in to an office or a church, you say, I do, and you walk out and you're married. Uh, once again, just a quick review, the marriage celebration of the time had basically, you could say, three parts. Uh, the promise was made. Uh, the groom would go to the bride's home and the promise would be made, and they were legally married, not just engaged, but legally married. Uh, then the groom would return. They would not be together. The groom would return to his father's house to prepare a place for his bride. Um, and again, you can reference that or think of that in a number of other places where Jesus uses that reference of how he's going to his father's house to come home to collect his bride. Uh, and then the big celebration took place when the groom came to collect his bride. You can think of Jesus teaching about the parable of the wise and foolish bridesmaids or virgins, uh, that they were waiting for the groom to come and collect his bride in that big celebration. Uh, Mary and Joseph were in the middle of that uh, marriage ceremony, that elongated, extended marriage ceremony. Uh, Joseph and Mary were legally married, uh, but they had not yet lived together. Uh, it was during that time that Joseph found out that uh, she was pregnant or she was with child. And that's when he 
was trying to wrestle with what to do. And just again, right in the text, it says on the top of page 312 that he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Uh, you can't divorce someone you're not married to. So even the text brings out the point that in Joseph's and Mary's mind, even though they had physically not been together as husband and wife, uh, they were legally married. Um, <clears throat> it was during that time that uh, all this took place. Uh, and Joseph then went and took his wife uh, based after the dream and the Lord speaking to Joseph in a dream. Uh, during the conversation that the Lord had, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, uh, mentions a couple of names. First of all, let's just use this opportunity to review some of the names uh, that we're familiar with Jesus. First of all, Jesus. Uh, you will give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Uh, Jesus comes from the Hebrew verb that means to save. Uh, some other names do as well. Uh, and Jesus was Jesus' common, everyday, well-known name. Um, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary. Jesus um, was his everyday common name. Yeah, the angel of the Lord speaking to uh, Joseph in the dream pointed out, uh, or sorry, the, the commentator, the, the author of the gospel, points out that all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said, that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Uh, again, that's a beautiful name and a perfect name for Jesus, that God himself, the creator, took on flesh to be one amongst and one of his own created. Um, God with us. Uh, by extension, it also has this idea of why he came into this world, to be with us, to be our Savior, to be on our side. And for all of us, as we trust in Jesus as our Creator and as our Savior, um, we know that he's on our side. He's with us every day. Uh, Jesus told his disciples, go and make other disciples, and I will be with you to the very end of the age. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and a good shepherd never abandons his sheep. Uh, some other names, the most famous one, and I'll just make quick reference to that, Jesus Christ. Christ is the New Testament Greek name, which means the anointed one. Uh, Messiah is the Old Testament Hebrew version of the anointed one. That is a title. Uh, it was not his last name. It is his title. Peter, the apostle, brings this out when Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they came up with all sorts of different uh, answers. But uh, Peter and the other disciples also agreeing with Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the anointed one. You are the promised one. You are the one savior. And obviously we'll be talking more about that at different situations or different times in our study. How did the Lord work things out for Jesus to be born in Bethlehem? Just as the Lord works everything out in this world through history. Uh, so we don't see God's hands necessarily working, but in the history, it often looks like coincidence or man's work. But the Lord is always in control. It was the Lord who made sure that Caesar Augustus was in charge. It was the Lord who made sure that the Romans were ruling over a large section of the world at that time. It was the Lord who made sure that Caesar Augustus would call for a census and work it out so that Joseph, who was living up in Galilee, uh, would have to come back to Bethlehem, uh, the city of David, the city of his ancestors, so that Jesus would be born there. Um, the Lord is constantly working through history, working things out for the good of his people, working things out to keep his promises. List the reasons for the shepherd's fear. It says on the bottom of page 312, an angel of the Lord appeared to them. These were the shepherds living out in the fields nearby, nearby Bethlehem. It says the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. Um, I don't think it's that difficult to understand why the shepherds were frightened. Uh, the middle of the night, out in the countryside, uh, dark, um, 
And all of a sudden, the glory of the Lord shone around them. The glory of the Lord manifested in the form of physical light, uh, just shocking them, first of all. And then to the extent that their minds could begin to process that this was the glory of the Lord, not just some type of flash of lightning, but something divine, a whole new level of fear rightfully came upon them because we're talking about normal, sinful human beings, imperfect human beings, standing in front of the glory, majesty, holiness, and perfection of God. And even as I speak those words, there's a, even though I am confident of my forgiveness in Jesus Christ, and I know what he's done for me, still I know what a sinful human being I am, namely how imperfect I am, and the thought of standing in front of God's glory just gives, makes me shiver just a little bit. Uh, a little bit of commentary. I have to point this out every time I study this with people. Um, it's, it's natural. It's understandable for people to be frightened by the glory of God. Because without the good news of Jesus Christ, the glory of God just reveals our sin and helps us realize, makes it very clear that we deserve to be condemned. It's understandable why people's gut reaction, knee-jerk reaction to church and the Bible and Christians is is one of wanting to shy away because they realize that there's a part of that message that condemns us. And it's not pleasant. None of us like to have our mistakes highlighted. None of us like to be shown to be wrong. Um, it's, it's, it's not comfortable. But then there's a beautiful illustration immediately. What did the angel say as the shepherds were filled with this fear? The first things that came, the first words that came out of the angel's mouth was, do not be afraid, I bring you good news. What a beautiful expression of, or an example of the ministry of Christians, the ministry of sharing God's word, the Bible. Yes, I know you're afraid. I, I know it's kind of scary to talk about God. I, I know what it's like. I, I get it. But don't be afraid. Honestly, I want to share good news with you. Yes, I know God is all powerful and he is holy, but I have good news. I want you to know that you don't need to be afraid. And that good news always is Jesus Christ. And we'll continue to talk more about that as we, we study the chapters that cover the New Testament. Um, what did the shepherds do after they had seen the baby? Well, it says when they had seen, I'm reading here on page 313 about the middle, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Uh, totally understandable. Um, something amazing they had seen, something amazing they had heard, something amazing they had exper experienced. Of course they're going to tell others. And you put all these three pieces together, you really have a beautiful outline of Christian ministry. And when I use that term, I'm speaking of private as well as any form of public ministry. Um, God's word comes to us and there's a certain amount of fear, but God comes and says, don't be afraid. And we're comforted with the good news of Jesus Christ. And as we, just as we trust in that good news and we are comforted with that fear, then we are motivated to tell others about it. Please take a few moments, pause the video, and read through pages 313 to 315. Thank you. Uh, honestly, as I've been working through this, there's a couple of corrections here in the beginning. I haven't found a lot really through the whole Old Testament. Once again, it has to do with the editorial bridge. Uh, they mention, they make it sound as if uh, Simeon and Anna uh, interacted with Jesus, Mary, and Joseph at the time of his circumcision uh, and that they met him implies that they met him in Bethlehem. The Bible tells us they saw Jesus in Jerusalem after Mary's time of purification, 40 days after the birth of a son. Uh, this isn't life and death uh, information, but just to be clear and just to make a slight correction, it's important. So Jesus was circumcised, according to the law, eight days after his birth. That's also when he was officially given his name. But then it was 40 days after the birth of a son that Mary and Joseph could then go to Jerusalem and fulfill 
the rules or the law of purification that were required after the birth of a Jewish child. And that's where they met uh, Simeon and Anna. Uh, then we also jump ahead and we take a look at the account of the Magi from the East. Once again, uh, this does not take place. All our Christmas cards and nativity scenes are a little inaccurate. The uh, Magi came much later uh, to visit Mary and Joseph. Uh, they come to Bethlehem, but uh, they meet with Mary and Joseph in a house. Uh, this could have been two, even uh, yeah, up to two years after uh, Jesus' birth. But the question we want to wrestle with is, how do you think the Magi knew about a promised king of the Jews? Uh, you can give you a hint, Daniel. Uh, Daniel, if you go back and take a look at that, you can either review it in the story or just open up your full Bible. Uh, Daniel became the head of the wise men or Magi. Magi, uh, <clears throat> a Magi is a wise man. It's where we get the English word magician. Again, not trickery, not implied that, but just someone who knows things and can do things and understand things that perhaps the average person cannot. Uh, we need to remember just a little bit of history. Those of you who know me know I like uh, history and the background of the history going on beyond the, what's in the pages of the Bible. Uh, after the Babylonian captivity, yes, a number of Jews came back and resettled Jerusalem, but for many years from the time of the return to Jerusalem through the time of the life of Jesus and even many years after uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, uh, the Jewish community, there was a huge Jewish community and one of the centers of learning for uh, Jewish studies, Old Testament studies was in the ancient city of Babylon. And so for the Magi, wise men from the East to know about the Jewish prophecies of a coming king, a coming savior, a coming messiah uh, is not really that surprising. Um, again, the miraculous part of the star and everything that went on with it, the Lord was working that out, but that's how the, it's very reasonable and understandable for uh, magi or wise men from the east to know about a promise of a king of the Jews. Uh, how did the magi know to go to Bethlehem? Well, once again, they uh, had to get that information from the scriptures. They arrived in Jerusalem, understandably so. That's where you would expect to find a king in the capital city. Uh, they did not find him there. So Herod uh, called for the scribes and the scholars, and there the prophecy was pointed out in Bethlehem in Judea. And then they quote, but you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So once again, the scriptures witnessing the truth of the coming Messiah. We continue now uh, with the visit of the Magi finding their way to Bethlehem. Where did they find Mary, Joseph, and Jesus? Yes, in Bethlehem. It is noted on page 314 that, um, that they came and they were in a house. So Mary and Joseph had settled there. Uh, I'm going to skip the second question for a second. How old might have Jesus been when the Magi visited? Well, when the Magi returned and didn't report where the child was to Herod, Herod being angry gave the order to kill all the boys in the vicinity of Bethlehem two years old and under. So it is very reasonable that this could be anywhere upwards to two years after the birth of Jesus. Um, now the second question I skipped over, how did the Lord use Joseph to care for Jesus? Uh, I don't know if this is just be, going to become a soapbox for me, but, uh, you know, we, we speak so much about Mary and understandably so, but it, it really is amazing how God used Joseph. And just as the Lord had chosen Mary, uh, so also he chose the package with Joseph as the legal father of Jesus. Uh, once again, you look at the genealogies, Jesus' legal heritage Jesus' legal uh, heritage as a descendant of David comes through Joseph. 
And I got to give a lot of credit to Joseph, not only for humbling himself and trusting the Lord, as he was told in the dream, to make to take Mary as his wife, but then how faithfully Joseph took care of Mary and Jesus. Um, obviously, he, that they had stayed there in Bethlehem, and he found a way for them to live there, and he protected them and cared for them and provided a home for them. And then we read in this section that Joseph was told in a dream, get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt because the Lord was warning him about what Herod would do to come and kill the children. Joseph didn't complain. Joseph didn't hesitate. Joseph didn't dawdle. He got up and he picked up his family and he took care of them and he took them to Egypt. Uh, then when the time was right, um, after Herod died, the Lord appeared to Joseph again in a dream in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother, go back to the land of Israel. And once again, Joseph did what was needed to be done to take care of his family. And then when they got back to Israel, they were afraid to stay in the south in, in Judea uh, because one of Herod's sons, Archelaus, was reigning there in Judea. And so the Lord instructed him, warned him in a dream, and they took him up north to Galilee, to the city of Nazareth. Um, Joseph, in my opinion, we don't spend enough time talking about him and holding up, him up as a model of a faithful husband and a faithful father, doing what needed to be done to take care of his family, taking care of his wife, taking care of his child. Um, again, he really is a hero in my eyes. Enough of that. Uh, moving on, we talked about how did Jesus end up growing up in Nazareth, and that is how he, in his adult life, is known, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, even on the cross, uh, when we talk about that, notice was posted on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And we'll also note in a future lesson how some people who are questioning, could Jesus, this Jesus, be the Messiah? But how can he be the Messiah? Because he's from Nazareth. I thought the Messiah was supposed to be from Bethlehem. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that when the time is right. Now, if you would, just pause the video for a little bit and read through pages 315 and 316, beginning there on the bottom of 315. As we conclude the chapter, we take a look at this little bit of information that we have from Jesus' childhood uh, when he was 12 years old. We hear a lot about his birth and those early years. And this is the only information that we have in the scriptures about Jesus' life from the time of his birth and childhood to his public ministry as an adult when he was 12 years old. Uh, Mary and Joseph, what were they going to Jerusalem to celebrate? As with many faithful Jewish people, according to God's law, they traveled up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Uh, again, this from Nazareth, we're, we're talking uh, probably about a 50 mile some journey, but they traveled up or down geographically down north to south. But Jewish people always refer to going up to Jerusalem, going up the mountain to Jerusalem. Uh, so they traveled up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Uh, they celebrated the Passover, and as was the custom, uh, they traveled perhaps with extended family, friends and family from the community of Nazareth when it was time to go home. Uh, and you can still see this in, in family gatherings to this day. Uh, the dads and men hung out with one another. The ladies traveled and walked together, and the children probably ran circles around them, uh, traveling twice the distance in a day, but being young, having the energy to do so. When the day had come to an end and it was time to settle down for an evening meal uh, and rest, uh, that's when the mom and dads and the children would gather together. Uh, Mary and Joseph, it was at that time they realized, hey, where's Jesus? Um, Mary and Joseph were human beings. They are human beings, just like us. They were not perfect parents. They were not bad parents. They were very good parents, but they were not perfect. They <laughs> had misplaced their child. So, with that normal fear, 
and trepidation that any parent feels whenever they think, or God forbid, you've lost a child. They rushed back, all the way back through the middle of the night to Jerusalem, and they searched in Jerusalem. Uh, where did Joseph and Mary find Jesus, and what was he doing? Um, it's interesting. It took some time for them to find Jesus in the temple courts. Uh, perhaps they looked at the market. I don't know if Jerusalem had anything like playgrounds back then, but perhaps they looked at typical places where children would hang out. Um, again, <laughs> no disrespect to our churches, but uh, if we were missing a child, I don't think most of us would immediately think, oh, yeah, the child is in church in the church library reading through some commentaries or perhaps in the pastor's office discussing theology. Um, but that's where they found Jesus. They found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, asking them questions. And it says, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Um, that's where they found Jesus. And he was discussing God's word with the people whose lives and professions were all about studying God's word. Uh, not only was he asking questions, or discussing it, but giving answers. And these elders were amazed. Um, again, we're starting to see examples, or we're seeing another example, I should say, of that mystery of Jesus, true God and true man. Um, my mind, just with the Trinity as a whole, and then the divinity of Jesus, this humanity and divinity, one person, true God, true man, uh, my mind logically can never wrap itself around those truths. My heart believes it because God says so. The Bible teaches us so. But it is an amazing thing. And here we see this example. And uh, I, I don't know if we can ever truly appreciate or understand what that must have been like. Uh, someday when we're sitting face to face with our God, maybe that's when we'll begin to understand. But we can take the scriptures at face value and believe them. Uh, they were reunited. And then on page 316, uh, there's the phrase where Mary and Joseph, why were you searching? Why were you searching for me? He said, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Uh, Jesus was not being defiant. Jesus was not being disobedient. Um, it was Mary and Joseph who had left him behind, who didn't check up on him. Um, and it was Mary and Joseph who didn't go to the temple, the house of Jesus' father, so to speak, uh, immediately. Uh, but it says they, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Again, oh, I, I do have sympathy, empathy for Mary and Joseph. Yes, the Lord spoke to Joseph in dreams. Yes, the angel came and visited Mary and they saw many miraculous things. But trying to wrap your mind around the fact that the child that you care for, that you love, that you're raising is also true God, um, I, I can't, it would be a challenge for anyone. But then it's interesting, it says, then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And I asked the question, in what way was it humiliating for Jesus to be obedient to Mary and Joseph? And understand I'm using that term humiliating, not in the sense of, you know, being beaten down or, you know, just often as we commonly use it, but humiliating as in acting in a way less than he deserves or being treated in a way less than he deserves. Um, Mary and Joseph were not perfect parents. Jesus was and is a perfect human being. He was a perfect child. Um, but nevertheless, Jesus was obedient to them. Why? Because he was obeying the commandments. Honor your father and mother. And even though, technically speaking, we could say Jesus didn't need to obey Mary and Joseph because he was perfect. He constantly obeyed them whether they wanted him to or not. He humbled himself and was obedient to them, even in their imperfections. Um, I remember one presentation on the fourth commandment as we count them that children do not obey their parents when they're right or because their parents are right they obey them to honor God. My parents were not perfect. I am not a parent, perfect parent, and my children are not perfect parents. We make mistakes. Sometimes it truly is not fair to make a child go to bed earlier than they feel like. 
but they are to obey. And the fact that Jesus humbly obeyed Mary and Joseph was him keeping the law perfectly and doing it for us for all the times when we have not perfectly obeyed our parents or anyone or someone else in authority. Now, just to try to summarize what we've seen in this chapter, just some simple answers to some questions. What prevents people from recognizing their true creator? The simple answer is our disobedience, our sin, original sin, uh, whatever you want to call it. It's, uh, we're separated from our creator because of what we have done, what our ancestors have done. Uh, how are people restored to a relationship with their creator? Well, that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came into this world to restore the relationship that was lost in the garden, the relationship that our Heavenly Father wants us to have with him from the beginning. He created us to have that perfect relationship with him, and it is restored through Jesus Christ, and we will experience that perfect relationship in the life to come. What do the names and titles of Jesus teach us? Again, we went through those, but they're worth reminding, be worth remembering. Uh, Jesus, the one who saves, comes from the Hebrew verb to save. Emmanuel, God with us, someone who is not only who has not only lived among us, walked in our shoes, taken on human flesh, but one who is with us on our side, uh, the one who has forgiven us, and our King, who continues to protect us and take care of us. And our Good Shepherd, who not only watches over us now, but is with us to the very end and will gather us to be with him in eternity. And then also remember again, Christ, the New Testament term, Messiah, the Old Testament term, both meaning anointed one, the one who is chosen, the special one. That is Jesus' title. Out of all the people, out of all the little Jewish boys, the descendants of Abraham ever born into this world or whoever will be born into this world, there is only one who came into this world as true God, true man, and who lived a perfect life and sacrificed that perfect life on the cross to take away our guilt, to pay the price for our sin, and to cover us with his holiness so that we are judged innocent in God's eyes. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. God be with you all.